Raul Meza Torres, the youngest hitman of the Sinaloa cartel. Long before he turned 15, this teenager knew exactly what he wanted to be. Raul Meza Torres wanted to become a sicario for the Sinaloa cartel. And the craziest part is that he got his wish before he turned 15. But Raul was not the only 15-year-old sicario in Mexico. There were many. But unlike his gun-toting juvenile peers, there was something special about Raul. Something that other teenage hitmen clearly didn't have. Catching them young. The concept of kids like Raul selling drugs, running around with guns and killing people sounds strange and disturbing to most people. But for those familiar with the violent business of Mexico's cartel, it is a reality. A sickening reality that has gone on for decades. Children as young as 10 years old have been known to run drug rings in their high schools for twisted older members of known cartels. And when those individuals decide the time is right, they order these poor younglings to carry out hit jobs on their behalf. REDEM, a children's rights organization in Mexico, released a study estimating that 30,000 children were already working for the cartels by 2019 as lookouts, street-level drug dealers, or sicarios, and another 250,000 were at risk of being recruited. But it doesn't end there. They also estimated that 21,000 children were murdered in Mexico between 2000 and 2019, and a disturbing majority of these kids played an active role in the violence that took their lives. Now, the sad reality is that most of these kids had no choice but to join the cartels because they provided an escape from poverty and protection from rival cartel violence. But in the case of Raul Meza Torres, the reality is a little bit different because Raul was not poor and he definitely did not need protection from rival cartels. If anything, they probably needed protection from him. So who was Raul Meza Torres? And why are we giving him more attention than other kid killers? Raul Meza Torres was born in Culiacán, Sinaloa on the 31st of October 1991. And from the moment he took his first breath, you could tell there was going to be a big problem in the young boy's future. Why? Everyone in and around his circle was neck deep in the Sinaloa cartel. His father, Raul Meza Ontiveros, was a legend in the Sinaloa cartel, commonly referred to as LM6. The old man was so far up the cartel rankings that he became the right-hand man of Javier Torres Felix, aka LJT, who was the leading drug operator of the mysterious and notorious narcotics overlord Ismael Almayo Zambada. Raul's father had an impressive criminal resume and a knack for escaping the arms of the law. In 1989, he was arrested by the Sinaloan police for several counts of homicide and somehow managed to wiggle himself free. However, a year later, he would be charged again, but this time for kidnapping and assault against two women. But once again, he proved too slippery and managed to get off scot-free. It wasn't until the 27th of May 1997, when Raul was just six years old, that his father found himself in a situation that proved almost impossible to escape. He was arrested by the feds and was linked to a safe house that held 384 kilograms of Colombian cocaine along with weapons and several cars that had been customized to distribute it. This discovery earned Raul's father a 10-year sentence. But miraculously, and a lot of miracles happen when you're a drug lord in Sinaloa, Raul's father got out after just spending a year behind bars. In the eyes of the law, the senior Raul was a hardened criminal who was only walking free because of the rot in the system. But to seven-year-old Raul, his papa was a legend. And his family was not lacking in the little boy's definition of legends. His mother, Aida Elizabeth Torres Felix, was the sister of LJT, Raul's father's boss that I mentioned earlier. And LJT also happened to have another equally notorious brother named Manuel Torres Felix, aka LM1, who also worked closely with Raul's father. But it wasn't just his uncles. Several of his cousins were heavily involved in the family business. Heck, by the time Raul hit puberty, his girlfriend was none other than Teresa Zambada Niebla, the daughter of Elmayo Zambada himself. Raul was narcotics royalty. He was in deep, and like a fish who can't perceive water because it's been around all its life, Raul couldn't conceptualize a life outside of crime. While kids his age were in school studying, Raul was learning firsthand the inner workings of the Sinaloan drug trafficking business. And while those kids played football in parks and with toys at home, he learned to use guns that were often too large to fit in his tiny arms. Raul the Sicario At the age of 15, Raul became involved in the activities of the cartel, serving as one of their young assassins. And people began to call him El Mini Six, a derivative of his father's alias, El M6. Raul did his best to live up to his father's reputation as he tried to make a name for himself. 
Older members of the cartel respected him. Some of them even began talking about how influential he would be in the cartel in the years to come. The younger ones admired him and wanted to be like him. His gun-toting posts on Facebook made him quite popular and turned him into something of a narcotic social media influencer that convinced several young Mexican boys his age to join the cartels. Without knowing, Raul had taken the terrible reality of drug pushing and mayhem and somehow turned it into one glamorous adventure. Whether it was deliberate or just a consequence of his age and the times, we will never know. But what we do know is that he was living his dream life and everything was going just as he had hoped and planned until tragedy struck. In March 2007, Raul's father was killed in a shootout with some armed men. The details around his death are a mystery even today, and unsurprisingly, Raul's family refused to cooperate with the police, so in the end, no one was charged or arrested in connection with the homicide. The effect of his father's death must have done a number on young Raul, who was still 15 at the time. But while most people would receive his father's death as a warning and a lesson of the consequence of living a life of violence, Raul doubled down on his delinquency. His violent lifestyle was now running on steroids, and he became more reckless. Did he feel the need to fill his father's shoes, or was he trying to prove something to someone? Himself? Again, we will never know. But just know this, his recklessness did not go unnoticed by the authorities, and soon enough, it led to their very first encounter. The Fall of El Mini Six on the 9th of October 2007, just a few months after his father's death, Raul was driving through the Las Quintas neighborhood of Culiacán, along with two friends, when policemen pulled them over. The three friends were driving in an armored vehicle that had no license plates, and when the police interrogated them, it became obvious that the car was stolen. Raul claimed the car was his, but he had no paperwork to back his claim, so the cops had no choice but to arrest him. However, he wouldn't stay long in prison because he was still a minor at the time, or maybe it was because of his family's connections. Whatever it was, Raul was released back into society. Anyone else would have seen this as another opportunity to turn their life around. Others would have probably laid low and taken fewer risks, not Raul. He was the fish in the water. Violence was his way of life, his oxygen, and there was no other way for him to live. By 2009, Raul had his second encounter with the police. Raul was drag racing in Las Quintas, the same area where he had been arrested two years prior, when some cops showed up and ordered the racers to stop. Now, he could have stopped and just left in peace, but Raul chose his definition of the easy route and began shooting at the police. The police responded with fire, and in the end, one of the policemen was injured. Meanwhile, Raul and his accomplices managed to escape. However, they left one of their cars behind, and when investigations were carried out later by state authorities, they were able to find that the abandoned vehicle not only belonged to Raul Meza Torres, but that his father was the legendary drug lord that had died just two years before. In addition to that, they also found ammunitions of various kinds within the car. Raul had now become a wanted man, and his reckless reign of terror had now triggered an active countdown. His final moments. On the 29th of April 2010, just five months after his 18th birthday, Raul got into a final confrontation with the Mexican police officers. The police were patrolling the Las Aguilas neighborhood in the city of Zapopan, Jalisco, when they stumbled on what looked like a suspicious vehicle. Within the vehicle was 18-year-old Raul Meza Torres and his 22-year-old friend Fidel Rojas Felix, who also happened to be a member of the Sinaloa cartel and also on the wanted list of the Mexican police. In that moment, the police did not realize who they were, but they demanded to search the gentleman's vehicle. So, Raul and Fidel were left with two choices. They could either stand down and allow the police to complete their search, risking the discovery of their identity, or fight back and find a means of escape. At this point, you can probably guess what choice Raul went for. He was no longer a minor, and if he had been arrested, he was bound for a lengthy jail sentence. So, both men grabbed their guns and tried to intimidate the cops by shooting into the air. But the unintimidated policemen responded by telling them to calm down and surrender themselves. So, Raul turned his gun to the policeman and opened fire killing one officer in the process and injuring a second officer who managed to shoot Raul before going down. As soon as Felix saw that his friend had been shot, he tried to escape on foot, but other policemen in the vicinity chased him and caught him on a nearby rooftop. The Aftermath With the murder of one police officer and attempted murder of another, Raul and his friend Felix were in a lot of trouble and were definitely going away for a long time. The police also found weapons in their car, handguns and multiple rounds of ammunition. However, only Felix had the chance to defend himself because Raul died from his gunshot wounds. 
He had been rushed to a hospital that night, but by 3.40 a.m. the next morning, the doctors pronounced him dead. But this is where things begin to get weird. Raoul's autopsy raised a lot of questions that conflicted with the original reports of the police at the scene of his death. Because in addition to the gunshot wounds, Raoul also had multiple injuries on his head, suggesting that he had been hit several times with a blunt object. And there was no indication of this in the police report. In court, Felix claimed the weapons found in the vehicles didn't belong to them, and they were simply carrying it for a senior cartel member they had met earlier, known as Coronel Villarreal. Felix also tried to pin everything on Raul, who was now dead and couldn't defend himself. Nice move, bro. He claimed that the cops had made up the story of him being an accomplice and that they had tortured him into a confession. The court didn't buy this story, though, and Rojas Felix was sent to jail for killing a cop and attempting to kill another. To this day, no one knows for certain the true circumstances that led to Raul's death. But does it really matter? Today, Raul is considered an urban legend, and folk songs Narco Corridos have been sung in honor of his brief, violent, and ultimately tragic life. But will these songs serve as a warning to other young boys to stay away from a life of crime? Or would they perhaps serve as inspiration toward further future tragedy?